Can you see our slides okay? John? They can. Uh, I'm making you the presenter now, so as soon as you share your screen, okay. everyone will be able to see it. Okay. And now it? we see them great. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, we started out with a title of 52%, and we thought we would just explain um, a little bit again, for those who weren't with us last week, about why we chose that title. And it's we've read competing numbers on this, but we chose it because it represents a consensus opinion that non-traditional learners are clearly the majority and the new norm amongst undergraduate students in the United States. And there was a great quote from the Atlantic uh, magazine earlier this year. And they actually quote a much higher number. They say as many as 73% of US students enrolled in a degree program today are described as what we used to call non-traditional students. They're not bright-eyed co-eds fresh from high school, but rather adults who are financially independent, working to support themselves, and often a child or relative as well. These students play many roles. And we'll talk about a lot of those today, some of which inevitably take precedence over their education, which is why most of them attend school part-time. So that's a quote from the Atlantic, but it also represents the population that we work with. Um, and they're relevant because they're a new majority on campuses. They're also relevant, we think, because they, they're living the educational reform that others are advocating for. They are, the, they are people who demand and receive relevance from their courses. They become immediately more effective in the workplace the next day because of what they learn in the classroom. Um, and we talked about that a lot last week, is how classroom learning so often goes beyond the classroom to relevant and immediate application, moving beyond theory to application. I am aware um, on a daily basis how important it is for adult learners to see the link between what they're doing now and what they're going to be doing the next day. There are a lot of questions about that every time I work with them. And a lot of conversation back and forth in the classroom about what other people have done or plan to do to use this in the very near future. So they're, they're looking right at the next day. It's not like, oh, that's a great idea. Maybe someday I'll use that. Probably not. Which is my experience of working with people that have not been in the work environment and are just fresh out of um, an, uh, you know, high school or one year of college. Um, as a parent and as educators, we've looking, we've been following the debate about educational reform, and there's been a lot of question really even about the value of a college degree. This is a, this is a headline that was on NPR, I think it was earlier this year. Um, a, a, an entrepreneur who's offering $100,000 fellowships for people not to go to college. So there's a lot of challenge just to the very value of a degree. And we think that our non-traditional students have answers as to what is the value of the degree. And they resonate with the very best reasons to get an education. Now, for the record, if you read the whole article and not just the headline, he wasn't questioning whether or not college itself has value, just whether it's the right choice for everyone. And we would add to that question the right, whether or not or when is the right time for everyone to go to college. Um, I was a traditional college student, as was I. And as I look back, I enjoyed the learning I had. It was, I was a history major. It was fabulous. I love reading and studying history. It, if, but the degree we're offering now, I can see as being so much more relevant to who I became. And the classes that we're offering now, I would have, I was, would have been, I was foaming at the mouth to take by the time I was in the workplace. And so I can see th there's such value in that. And I, of course, have picked a highly relevant subject, relevant subject to get my bachelor's degree. I was a classics major and studied Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. <laughs> so that was right up my alley when I, <laughs> when I got out of school. And I loved it. I loved it then. I love it now. 
but it took me like eight years of teaching Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and English in the schools to realize what I really wanted to go for in the next round. Right. Um, we, and while we're doing our introduction, we wanted to talk again about why we're so passionate. So I put a picture of just one of our classes, and every single face on there represents one of the many reasons why we're so passionate, and that is what I call the awesome factor. <laughs> um, it's a very non-academic term. You may not have seen it written up in journals, but it really captures our students. Um, they are so many things. They're entrepreneurs, they're parents, they're retirees, they're single moms, police officers, military veterans, single dad, career professionals, they're leaders in the community, and they're combinations of all of those things. Being with them and learning from them enriches our lives as, as instructors, as I'm just so honored to be part of the program. And we're inspired by their imaginations about the ways to work together to make the world a better place. We can see that our students really, truly are making a difference. Um, we showed you some of those in our portfolio projects last week that, and how they document the tangible, measurable, and important ways that they do so. And we're inspired because they have visions of more to come. Um, this is a, this is a, shows a link to a description of a recent class. And there's just a few descriptions you can see there. But we have students who have been active in seeking to end sexual trafficking. Um, one of our students put together an entire conference on the subject as her capstone project. Others who are advocates for education. I think of um, a recent graduate who started an organization that empowers parents of Latino children to better support their children's education. She graduated two years ago and she continues to run that program that she initiated as a student. And we have so many more examples of why our students' visions about their role in making a better future for themselves and the world inspire us. And that's why we're passionate about supporting them. Um, the other reason we're passionate is because the media, our politicians, and even often the universities that serve this new majority on campuses too often misunderstand them. They misunderstand their awesomeness, or they don't fully appreciate their awesomeness, and they're not fully understanding their unique needs. And I put these headlines up there. These are two recent headlines. Um, one came from an article that was actually written by a non-traditional student who refers to herself as having graduated late. And we, again, going back to the issue of questioning when you go to college, we don't see our students as people who are late by any stretch of the imagination. College can be a fantastic, relevant, and important learning experience when it's right for you. And those who finish when they're 25, 45, or even 75 are by no means late. This is a picture of and an article about one of our graduates from last May. And she happened to be going out to lunch to celebrate her graduation. And the reporter was happened to be sitting at the next table and overheard this and put it on the front page of the local paper. <laughs> um, the average age of our students is 40. Um, and we have students in every de decade from their 20s on up. So describing this new majority, um, there was an article I was reading about advising non-traditional students. And it had this description. Said adult learners come to campus with their backpacks full. They're full of experiences, challenges, and responsibilities, adding to the weight of their brand new textbooks in ways that set them apart from most traditionally aged students. Often they've delayed their enrollment because their lives have taken them down a different path, including marriage and raising a family, entering the military, and or working full time. And because of that, adult learners need to find their academic stride as well as their voice on campus. Despite being the new majority, this population tends to feel invisible on campuses, where activities and often even the language that's used is geared toward the traditional student. I noticed that on a campus recently in the, when they were doing presentations and they kept talking about the college kids. And I don't think of our students as kids. <laughs> Many of our students are older than we are. Um, they're not kids, they're adults. And it's and it really sort of graded to hear it repeated. Um, 
there was, I was coming across different resources for advising, and they listed a few of the events that focus on traditional students, welcome weeks, you know, pizza parties, ice cream parties, uh, student support services, all kinds of extracurricular activities and clubs. But there are often, on many campuses, few to no equivalent ways to build community and belonging for adult students. So in my classes, and I know in Teresa's as well, um, a lot of emphasis, therefore, is placed on helping build relationships in the classroom so that they feel connected to other people and know their names. They know their uh, professors, and they can ask for their professors again, and they can hope and plan for people that they really take a shining to, to be in the similar classes or the same classes later on. So they build or we build with them their own community uh, many times in the classroom because it's not built intentionally as much outside the classroom. And that's what we'll be talking about today, is how we build that community. So our intent is to discuss the ways in which universities can better serve this new majority. We want to move our awesome students from invisible status to one in which they feel that sense of community, to which they really feel a sense of belonging. We refer to ourselves often as the, the family, the NBA, the university family. And we want them to feel like they're part of that too, and to celebrate really the wholeness of who they are. So we'll talk about the practical steps, as well as important elements of building a culture that specifically nourishes the different and unique learning goals and needs of this new majority. So we talked a lot about what goes on in the classroom last week, and that's really an important part of what we're doing. Today we're going to move beyond the classroom and talk about some of the basics of what we do. And first I want to explain this picture. It was, Please do. <laughs> it was painted by one of our fabulous students who is yeah. also an artist. Her name's Maria Sanchez. And this piece, when she was showing us in class, really caught my eye because it's called Discombobulated. Um, and we talked about last week that there's much about the experience of students that we understand because we've been there. And in many ways, we still are there, balancing jobs with family and other ob obligations. So when I saw this picture, I thought, oh, that's me. <laughs> um, it's more, and showing this picture is more than a tribute to Maria, an amazing artist, but something that for me represents what it can feel like to be a non-traditional student. That Maria, when she painted this, did it when her husband was deployed to Iraq. She was at home. She works full time. She was organizing a new community support organization for local military spouses. She was attending school. Um, she has three children at very different ages. She was still finding time for her art. And she was supporting other Latina artists and starting an organization that, that advocates for their work. So to make college accessible for students who have that much on their plates, scheduling of classes is really obviously a primary concern. Ours are in an accelerated format, which means that they are students go to class one night a week for four hours for seven weeks. And after that seven weeks has passed, they finish three units. So they're focusing on often one class at a time, which fits an adult learning model. They're also um, only going to class one night a week. And a majority of what they're doing in terms of class work is done outside of the classroom. That works for people. It creates an accessible schedule. It resonates within an adult learning model. Some programs work this out by going entirely online. Um, some have programs on the weekends. I know my doctoral and master's programs were on the weekend, and that worked for me. And all of those things are, that schedule issue, I think, is the number one thing for making college accessible for adults. Um, this is also, this, the practical reasons for this are fairly obvious. But there, it also resonates for some reasons that are not just as, just as obviously practical. Um, students struggle with creating time to do their work. They may also struggle with lack of support from family or from their workplaces. So having an accessible schedule that allows them to 
take a take a break, get away from the other obligations for relatively short but manageable periods of time allows us to individually help students to focus on the goal of their getting their degree, but also to pace themselves and to proceed toward graduation at a pace that works for them. This is one of the issues where we see non-traditional students not represented in the national dialogue about educational reform because there is so much pressure on students from a financial aid perspective and from on universities from an accreditation perspective to make sure that students are graduating within four years. And that's not always the best for the students themselves. Um, there's plenty of there's plenty of gaps that our students have taken because great things happen to them, not because their classes aren't available. The most dramatic example I can think of is a student who almost finished her class. She was three units shy in the early 70s, unbelievably. And when she came back, it was literally five children, three marriages, and multiple grandchildren later when she was ready to finish. Now, that's a dramatic example. Like, you can't make federal policy around it. But we've had military students come in and tell us because of their financial aid, they need to finish within a short period of time. I had a student last semester who was in a senior seminar, almost ready to graduate, and now has delayed her graduation because she got a promotion and she ended up traveling to Germany for her job. It was some really fabulous opportunities. We have several students this semester who have taken time off because they're having babies. So their failure to finish within a federal definition of what is appropriate time frame is not recognizing the wonderful and challenging things that are going on in their lives. And speaking of babies, uh, I had a woman last semester who uh, delivered a little late and was determined to come back to school. Oh boy. Yeah. So she uh, brought her pump, and at the break, she would come to my office and pump her breast milk so she could take it back to her little girl. And then when that didn't get to be enough, then she came early before class, and we had a regular session. Of course, nobody else knew about it, but we had great things going on in my office. <laughs> in, the middle, in the middle of class. I've had that specific happen, too. And I remember doing that myself, except I couldn't find an outlet. And I remember wandering around all this Saturday trying to find an outlet and how hard that was. So sometimes the ways to accommodate our non-traditional learners really take understanding people individually and meeting them where they are. It, it's not a policy, it's, it's, a, it's a perspective. And that leads us to our next one, which is, you know, how can we help? Um, part of the logistics of supporting adult learners who are balancing careers, family, community commitments, including understanding and adapting, and really thinking how can we help is our guiding perspective to how we meet them. As, as people who are participating in the seminar, think about your own life and your obligations. You may be taking kids to soccer games, hosting Girl Scout troops, assisting with your church auction, working a professional job with various obligations, commuting, maintaining a household. I, occasionally, I even greet my husband. <laughs> now add attendance at college. How can we possibly do it? Um, the reality for me, and this is important for me to, as I approach my students, is that I don't do it. I just don't get it all done. There are things every week, every month that I should get to, I really should, that fall off my plate. There are doctor's appointments that I never get around to making. There are phone calls I don't return. When you're prioritizing deadlines, and that's course assignments as well as family obligations, some of your other to-dos, as important as they are, fall lower on your priority list. So part of building a culture that supports non-traditional students is building ease into the business processes. Um, we try to tell our students, your job is to do your classwork. We'll make the rest of it as easy as possible. Traditional students, if you're, you're living on campus, you might stop by an administrative office to take care of some paperwork in between getting up in the morning out of your dorm and grabbing a bite to eat at the cafeteria before on your way to class. Non-traditional students are struggling just to get from work, getting off work at 5, navigating the traffic around here, and getting to class by 6 o'clock. And if they don't have a magic wand that clears traffic out of the way, 
um, they may have struggled just to get there before class begins. So submitting that paperwork or filing your um, transcripts or whatever it takes can be a challenge. Um, I ask our students often what their schedules are like when they do take care of the things that have to be done but are hard to done, and a lot of people are doing it late at night when when business offices are not okay. open. When do I sign up my kids for activities or pay my bills? It's often in the middle of the night, which is why easy to use online services are really important. Um, and if you have to find somebody in person to talk to for, to accomplish some business purposes, it better be quick and easy because I'm going to be stopping by with moments to spare before I have to be in class. Um, and so that's a it, you know how can we help you is a really important part of that. And I've heard people argue and people say they're adults. They have to handle other things. They should be able to handle these business processes with more ease than the, than the than a traditional day student. And I get that argument, but I think it's also important to understand the perspective of a non-traditional student and the very many things they're trying to juggle and the inconvenience often of just being on campus and, and how much that's asking them to take away from the other things that are going on in their lives. <sighs> <laughs> I got overwhelmed just thinking about all the things students are doing. Yeah, you guys are doing good. Um, there's a couple things from the chat room that I wanted to bring in, and I think that we also want to encourage folks. Um, I asked them in there, how do you help your adult learners? So if you're in that situation, um, go ahead and reply on maybe some techniques that you use um, and some things that you guys do. Uh, Joe in the, in the chat room says uh, he also teaches adult learners. Um, and has several classes where he does that. He says that technology also helps. Um, years ago, it was all about office hours, and now cell phones and smartphones and tablets make make office hours obsolete, but it also makes you more connected to your students. He also says adult learners expect to be able to access their instructors at odd hours with a quick response. And so, uh -huh. because they're doing work at odd hours, they they appreciate that when instructors are able to do that. I had a question is. Um, what are some, in, do you guys run into institutional barriers in working with adult learners? And, and how do you get over that? How do you overcome some of those? Uh, I wanted to actually address the technology question first because I think that's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. That students can access technology and that makes things a lot easier. But as, as we talked about last week, some of our students are wizards of technology. I'll tell them I can't process their, their registration paperwork because there's a hold and they push a few buttons and suddenly they say, go ahead, I'm fine now. <laughs> and, uh, and others look at me like I'm crazy. And they have no idea how to do it. And part of that has to do with their technology gap and the generation gaps. Yeah. And right. there's, um, there's just a, a wide gap within our classrooms of how students are comfortable with technology. The access issue is funny because I find the same thing. Students will email me when they get done with classes, when they've got an issue that came out, or sometimes in a break in a class as, as, as the program director and advisor. Um, so I'm getting emails from them at 8, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And that's when I'm doing my work too because I've got little kids. And so I will often answer them at 2 in the morning <laughs> or at 4 in the morning because I'm trying to get my work done then too. So, and that's an, an interesting um, it's interesting to see how they've come to expect that, and I'm glad that we're able to to reach it. Have we found institutional? No. <laughs> no. Me. Yeah. It, there. Um, it's it's frustrating to say the least if we are presenting ourselves as how can we help you types of people, and then we don't have backup administrative support options to offer them. And it doesn't escape them, as Therese said, that they can't go um, maybe at break to talk with somebody in registration or somebody in the finance office. I'm sure it doesn't escape the people in, in the administrative and finance office that they would rather be home rather than uh, fielding questions from students. But the truth is, if your organization is moving toward working with people who need to be at school at night, sooner or later there has to be a shift in what you offer them and when you offer it and 
who is giving service and who's asking for service. So I see that as a, a really um, sort of poignant or pressing, certainly, question for our administration. And I'm sure we're not the only ones that are in that same pickle. I think Alexa is being constantly in the process of improvement. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay, I think so. Are there other questions? Uh, there was another question. Thank you for answering that. I know that it's a it's a difficult one too, but I think it's like what you said. It's poignant to know. And if there is a shift in, in the organization, then then the 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 administrative side does does or should have the onus of making accommodations. Um, there was one more comment from Kay, and she said one of her strategies is to take. Um, some of her online and virtual learning and break it up into smaller chunks um, so students can find that easier to fit in and, and take the time to get that done if, if it's more granular or chunked out. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. We wanted to talk a little bit about co-curricular activities. And the question is really, are they relevant? And I think that if you look at the research about the depth that co-curricular activities bring to the college experience, yes. You could say they're very relevant, with some caveats. Um, involvement on campus enhances the college experience, no matter what your age is. Um, Non-traditional students need the same orientation and materials and to gain networking and other advantages for involvement in student organizations. However, if they're asked to simply immerse themselves in the existing organizations, they're going to find them less relevant. Um, we had some students on the student government who stopped going to the meetings. And I said, why? And they said, yeah, they're at an accessible hour. They're right after I get off work. I just have to leave a little early. But all they talk about are dorm issues um, or life on campus issues. And they're just not relevant. And that was, so they weren't finding them to be resonating. So how do we make co-curricular activities relevant for adults? Um, and I was, a lot of states are looking at this question and I was, it was interesting to see some of the research from how other people were doing it, too. And there are student representatives on government committees. They can interact as peers with professors. Um, student organizations that meet in the evening that provide relevant opportunities, such as networking. And even child care can be a really important issue if you really want students to get on campus. Um, I went to a fabulous presentation at the um, HACU conference about a student orientation that focused not only on, for non-traditional students, that focused not only on the students themselves, but on their families, recognizing that if students were going to be successful in going back to school, it was going to require not just a, not just a commitment from the student, but from the family that was going to have to you know, watch them go to the library on weekends or disappear in the evenings to go to classes. And, they, and their orientation had a family track to it. It was beyond. Um, it was beyond just having the student come in for half a day, but having the family, a family track. Um, redefining what co-curricular is is important, too. And um, adult students arrive with a rich backpack of experience. We talked about this last week. They integrate these into classroom work as a matter of course. For traditional students, school is their world. And the repertoire of services usually reflects that expect expectation. But for this new majority on campuses, the world is their school. Um, and for assessment purposes, as well as for simply understanding and celebrating these students, we need to redefine the boundaries of what co-curricular is, Go beyond, going beyond what's offered on campus or sponsored by campus, and showing everything they're involved in. And we talked about e-portfolios last week as one way to do this, because they capture a full story about who the student is in relation to his or her academics, job, family, community. And because they address both reflections about the past and imagination about the future, they're extremely powerful. Um, service hours we wanted to talk about. <laughs> Being inclusive means time. When are the counseling, tutoring, library, and other services offered? Are they being closed when traditional students have time off, even if they're still on campus? Um, that these are, or even if non-traditional students are still on campus. We had this happen last year during the, the uh, spring break, 
when the library closed because there weren't very the not the traditional day students who lived on campus mostly weren't on campus. We had one of our most important classes because we didn't have the same spring break schedule that was being scheduled at night. And students showed up at the library to prep and found it closed. Um, so these are just small things to consider, not insurmountable, but they, how the message we send to adult students, seemingly minor decisions that contribute to making adult students feel like they're part of a community are really important. Um, a report about best practices in the Pennsylvania schools to reach adult learners noted that it is an, a look at the descriptors for best practices that fit around the theme of campus culture or environment showed a subtext around building a community and making adults feel included. So why would states care about this? Well, why do universities care for that matter? And the one reason clearly is sustainability. In other words, money. Even with reduced tuition, degree completion programs sustain many universities. And so the, the continued existence of these institutions relies on sound financial models. And investing in this new majority makes sense. The other reasons, especially for public universities, is political. Um, the president's issued a challenge to increase the number of Americans who have college degrees, because they want the United States to be, move ahead on that particular element of national success. And so many states have responded by looking, they can clear um, hurdles for current 18 to 20 or two year olds, but they recognize that they also need to reach out to adult learners, uh, non-traditional learners, knowing that to increase that number means um, addressing people who are already adults. So customized outreach includes fa um, activities, family nights, adult student lounges, adult learner orientation programs, adult learner honor societies, student organizations, websites. It also includes customized financial aid workshops, career focused seminars, help with skill building, social opportunities. We have coffee breaks once a term where students who don't have time to show up on campus for most anything can at least take a break from their class and come over and socialize, gather some materials, meet people, and grab a cup of coffee. Once a term before class, we'll have what we call grab and goes, where they same thing, they can come in, meet a few people. It's, it's sort of like um, co-curricular activities slash speed dating. <laughs> they can grab something to eat before they go to class. We want them to feel welcome, included, part of the family, and connected with one another. Um, programming and advising is important too. Um, advisors are key because they often go the extra mile in advocating for adult learners. And um, educators and administrators sometimes assume that adult learners need less attention. They're adults. They should be able to figure things out. They're not 18 year olds away from the home for the first time. But in fact, the opposite is often true, we find with advising. Um, in devising a program for adult learners, there's a lot of different advising options. You're not starting with a blank slate and filling it up to 124 units. You're starting with people who have already taken classes, maybe in multiple institutions, some that transfer and some that don't. There may be gaps in classes, such as you, you need two uh, language classes to graduate and you took Spanish one five years ago. Well, if you spend five years since you took your first language class, Taking Spanish 2 is not really your best option. It's hard to remember if you haven't used it in the meantime. Um, math requirements are another one that can require a lot of specialized advising because they include many prerequisites. And that's really off-putting to people who took high school math maybe decades previously. So it, um, deciding whether or not to accept work experience is important too. So all of these are part of the programming and advising considerations that are important and make advising for adult students especially important. Um, Tish talked last week about how you talk to non-traditional students in the classroom or, and in ways that are different, different from how you might address an 18-year-old. We think that the communication extends also to the nature of the communication. Um, we talked about how technology varies broadly and so does comfort with certain communication styles. Students, some, some students really want to talk to people face to face. Some prefer every variety of email, text, web, Facebook, Twitter, and more. So I put a, a typewriter up there because that was actually, I found it online, a picture of it, but that was my typewriter in college. Oh, yes, <laughs> my right. Betty Praxis 20, my high school graduation gift. And you see what students are, are doing now. It's so different. 
Um, we've taken a multi-dimensional approach to communications. We have newsletters that are handed out in class for those who need something to look at in hand and, and are Facebook or other social media adverse. We have a blog. We do use Facebook and we use LinkedIn accounts. I've been told we should start getting involved in Twitter. I'm not quite there yet, but we're, we'll keep it on the back burner of things to think about. But the point is, regardless of the forum, what each of these do is allow students to connect with one another and with us to share news and announcements and to have a tangible symbol of a community that they feel yes. in the classroom in a way that works for them. And this is also, we found, really important because it's a, because it has become a way of celebrating all that the students are. One of our students two summers ago was honored by the state legislature for her um, role as a woman in the military. Um, and we, we were able to gather the information and profile her in, sh in a way that otherwise would have been lost. Um, when a recent, a relatively recent graduate got funding for a nonprofit she started in her capstone class, we were able to post it online and celebrate it. When students have advising questions or need classroom information, we make, the, make, make sure that there's a single accessible place for them to find that. Not a single, or multiple accessible places for them to find that. Um, there's our Facebook page. Um, this is Oh, this is part of our LinkedIn page, yes. our group page on LinkedIn. Um, this is our blog. And if you look at it, I kind of highlighted there are different categories. Or as students have questions about advising or alumni news, things that inspire, book recommendations that they, they or other professors make all come up in there. And we have, we have tabs for classwork, for program information, for the faculty. We like to profile student feedback. Helpful links is basically um, a lot of the stuff that's in our handbook, but it's I use this all the time myself because it's easy to find. And we and we're building um, a concentration in gerontology, so that's there as well. But it's all relevant we find to building community, so that students feel like they know where to go, and there's a there's a face that represents who they are. Um, John, you would ask where more attention is needed. Um, Financial aid is a big one, and our regulations federally are changing, and we're finding them less it, to be less and less available for non-traditional students, and or or it's more limitations on its availability, and that's got us very worried. So more attention is needed to that, especially since this population is the new majority on campus. Um, this is not a solution that I have any information about, but I found it and was intrigued by it. That, that was discussed in some of the literature about reaching out to adult learners, and they talked about lifelong learning accounts in which employees make regular pre-tax contributions for tuition, books, and other educational expenses through payroll deductions, and contributions may be matched by employers. So I don't think that's something we're familiar with in this area, but I love the idea that people are thinking about this creatively. Um, and another, we need more attention to scholarship programs. There's very, very, very few scholarships available for part-time students. Um, a few students have found them. They're usually in the hundreds of dollars, which is helpful, but not enough. And um, we've been working internally to build a, a sort of a pay-it-forward scholarship fund um, that's in honor of and named after and envisioned by the two founders of our program, Dr. Lillian Barden and Dr. Deb Cash, and we're hoping to have that go. But I think is is a more that's our individual, temporary, hopefully future solution to part of the problem. But it's really a more it's a broader problem with this new um, majority on campuses. I find a number of my students have been able to get support from their companies from the work that workplaces where they spend their days and that is really very helpful and gives them a feeling of a connectedness between their school and, and their organization and of course it, it, it implies a commitment that uh, they need to answer. So that turns out to be a really helpful one but most organizations that are small don't have that option and so the people that work there have to deal with 
some of the things that Teresa is talking about here are borrow money. Right. And about only about 10% of our students work for organizations that help with the tuition um, reimbursement. And those 10% are great, but it would be nice if we could find increases to that. Uh -huh. um, and that's actually a good example going back to our advising, customizing our advising. Students have come and said, my employer, and it's there's major employers around here, but there's also small employers, needs to know. And there will be some very specific this is my job description. How precisely does this class fit in my job description? And that can be a real challenge when you look at accreditation requirements and how getting the totality of a degree with all the GE requirements, how a specific class can fit into a job description. But we we have instructors and we have advisors who are pretty creative <laughs> and students who are motivated and dedicated enough to make sure that what they're doing does resonate with what their requirements are in the workplace. Um, so that's been fantastic. Sort of like the IRS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're getting towards the end, but I wanted to talk about social justice and, and meaning and purpose. Because social justice is a big part of the mission of our organization. Um, our mission is defined as being inclusive, and if you could sum it up, it's, it's about seeking a better world. So providing a culture that nurtures this new majority on campus is an important part of that mission, not only because it ensures that education is accessible, but because it fuels action for the future. All of these fabulous people who are going out and doing wonderful things in the world. When adults are empowered, they become even better in many ways and more capable and more confident about serving and supporting others in the work of improving our communities and the world. And through the classes they take, people come in, as adults all of us have our fabulous ideas about what we want to do, but when you sit in a community of learners that your ideas merge with the brilliance of others and they can change as you become inspired by different things. And so that journey is very, a few people I've seen it be very linear, and I'm always impressed with people who know exactly what they want to do and go out and do it. But for many of us, it's more, um, it takes unexpected turns. And college is such a fabulous way of empowering those turns to be um, ones that are fueled by passion and imagination and knowledge. Um, yeah, we have I, a, uh, there's a, a comment in the chat room that that kind of goes along with uh, what you guys are talking about, and it's um, it's talking about how, how being flexible and, and having individualization is important, but uh, structured cohorts also have good success for adult learners. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something to be said to, like, go through the process with peers that support the adult learner and, and encourage them and each other to stay the course. Absolutely. I think that's really important, and I think that the cohort model can work really well for that. Um, what happens in most of our classes, even though it's not a cohort model, is that students see familiar faces. Yes. So if they walk into a classroom that's got 15 or 16 people in it, 8 or 10 of them will be people they've been classes with before. And so building on that and nurturing that community within and outside the classroom is really important, and I see students. I have a, one of our one of our. We have two satellite campuses, and one of them in particular is fairly isolated from our main campus in the sense that students mostly take their classes at that campus and never come on the main campus, um, just because of traffic, basically, and, and the amount of time it takes that time of day to get to the campus. And I've had students who said, "I came here for an education. I didn't expect to meet." my best friends. And as adults, you don't always, that's a rich, a rich gift to have as an adult is to meet new best friends. And I watch their interactions on Facebook and in the classrooms, and you can see that that, that depth of that support brings to their education and to really to who they are. Um, and so with that, we throw out a few lovely decals about um, in conclusion, 
Um, but we wanted to open it up to additional questions, too. Because we yeah, I just uh, I put that in the chat room. And so um, for everyone who sees the slides, go ahead and um, what are some of your reactions or what are some questions that you have um, or some questions that kind of came up as a result of the session. Um, I'll go through a couple more uh, reactions from the chat room uh, from earlier, and that's it. and for everyone else, just go ahead and get your current questions and reactions into the chat room or send a question in GoToWebinar. Um, Joe said he found that um, adult learners are looking for help with many issues, including child care. Um, mm -hmm. They look to their instructors for input, feedback, and information on issues outside of the classroom. And he says that's where the instructor becomes a, a resource in addition to being a teacher. Absolutely. And sometimes that's, um, it, that's it can be intimidating. It can also be empowering because you, you're, in many cases we end up learning together. When I first started teaching here, I wasn't, I hadn't, I didn't live in the area, so I didn't have a lot of local resources. And so you sit down and say, well, how do we figure this out together? If someone would say, where am I going to work on for my capstone project? And the, the, sometimes not having the answers can drive you to better outcomes. <laughs> yeah, and then Kay, um, Kay said that she agrees that uh, that variety, and I think this goes back to when we were talking about the modes of communication that you guys use with your groups. Uh, she said that a variety is key in so many aspects. And so, Kay, if you're out there, maybe you can say a little bit more about uh, that. Mac wants to know um, what's new, what's, what are new and emerging technologies promise to help address the problems that you guys mentioned with um, creating a community and a culture for adult learners? Uh, what are new technologies for doing it? Um, we're still learning. I am. Um, we've done a lot in the last two years with with social media, and we're always keeping our ear to the ground for new technology that can enhance that. And sometimes the students in the classroom are the ones who give uh, give us ideas for what can be done. Because there's we've had students who work for for Google for Facebook, who are much more uh, cutting edge when it comes to technology than we are. So. Um, I, I'm the, the person that advocates, especially since I spend uh, a lot of time in the classroom with people who are motivated to serve people, and they're going to go into work where they touch many people and most of them in need. I'm, I'm very motivated to be with them while we work on some of the issues that they're going to have to deal with. How do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with people that are uh, scared and bereft? And how do you translate what they need to know into language that they can understand and then take action on? So uh, I'm more of a person that thinks a lot about how to teach human contact in a way that in, enables people who will be talking to our students now or later and give them more than they have asked for and enough that they can move to the next step. So I'm sort of a, let's talk about it and let's let me look you in the eye kind of person because of the kinds of folks that I teach know. And uh, Mac, uh, Mac also said that a private Facebook page um, has helped his group that he's a part of. So that might be That's good. another something to consider. And Kay, Kay wants to know maybe one of you is brave enough to tackle this. In a nutshell, what is the cohort model? She hasn't heard it called by that name. Oh, we don't use a cohort model, but it is a um, it is a group of students who enter at the same time with the same needs for graduation. So let's say we require you, everybody who has finished an AA degree and finished all the general education requirements. If you came in as a cohort, you would be the same group of 15, 20 people who came to classes every time until you graduated. 
So you're like a fixed classroom of, of folks that go through the entire experience together. You see that a lot in um, graduate education mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. most students will start needing their 30 units to graduate and they can start from scratch. It wouldn't work with our particular, the students who come to our campus because they all come with a, you know, a jigsaw puzzle worth of previous requirements and they all have a different path to graduation as a result. But that's what it is. Great. I knew you could do it. Yay. <laughs> and you did good. Uh, for everybody out there, I'm going to go ahead. Thank you very much to our presenters. We're giving you a virtual round of applause. I think we need to get a some canned clapping so that so that we can do that in a more appropriate fashion. <laughs> Thank you so much, and, John. We really appreciate you. And Steve. Yep. Yeah, and so I'm going to go ahead and bring my screen. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my screen back up. We're gonna stay on for a uh, couple more minutes, and I can see my screen is loading. So first, thank you, which I've done. Um, as you leave, uh, give us a bumper sticker, Gestalt checkout, maybe one word or 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 uh, one sentence that kind of lets us know how you're leaving. And then for Nexus, um, our next webinar is gonna be October 14th. It's going to talk about the convergence of design thinking and organization development practice um, to see if there is some commonality among those two fields. Um, join us on LinkedIn. We will have a couple follow-up questions from this session and uh, continue discussion about adult learning on LinkedIn. Uh, and then all the recording and materials will be sent from GoToWebinar after this session if you don't get it. Um, just email events at nexusforchange.com. I'll put that in the chat room, events at nexusforchange.com, and we will get that out to you. And then also there is a uh, survey at the end from GoToWebinar if you guys wouldn't mind taking that. And um, Dr. Dr. Mann and Dr. Davis Wicks, I'm going to go through just a couple reactions. Joe says, uh, I teach undergrads at Tiffin, um, and their degree is their degree completion program is also a cohort, and he sends you three claps, clap, clap, clap. Uh, Julie says, challenging. Glad you dedicated. Glad you're dedicated to helping these adult learners. It's important. And Kay says there's some good ideas and considerations. Uh, she likes the holistic look that you guys took on adult learning. So those are some of our reactions, and so I think that with that, um, let's say thanks again, and uh, Dr. Madden, Dr. Davis Wicks, any final reactions from you as we leave? Thank you so much for having us. We really, really appreciate the time. We appreciate the chance to collaborate with you, and we appreciate everybody who was here. Great. Thank you very much, and, and, and yeah. thanks to both of you for putting together two great sessions. Um, and we will leave with one comment, and that's from Joe. He says, uh, from, for adult learners, it's to help facilitate the learning uh, from others rather than from self. Absolutely. And so with that, thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. You too. Yep. Bye-bye.